Welcome to the RustConf 2020 core team keynote. I'm Manish from the Rust core team, and I'll be giving a quick forward. First, a brief note. This talk was recorded before any of the recent events relating to Mozilla. Since then, we've put out this initial response on Twitter, as well as a post you can visit on the main Rust blog at blog.rustlang.org. This talk will be given by five members of the core team who will introduce you to. They'll be speaking in the following order. Nico is co-lead of the compiler and language teams. He works at Mozilla. Mark is lead of the release team and is the main maintainer behind perf.rustlang.org. He studies computer science as an undergraduate at Georgia Tech. Aiden is code lead of the infrastructure team and works with Rust at Hadean. Ashley has been involved in the crates.io community and infrastructure teams. She works at Apollo GraphQL building Rust and WebAssembly tooling. Nick is a Rust engineer at PingCap and has been involved in the compiler, language, and DevTools teams. So hello. This marks the fifth birthday of Rust. That is, this year, 2020, marks the fifth birthday of Rust. And what do I mean by the fifth birthday? I mean that five years ago, we announced Rust 1.0 to the world. Right? We basically said, Rust is open for business, ready for use, and we're not going to break your software anymore. Uh, if you were using Rust before 1.0, you know that we broke your software a lot. Um, we don't speak of those days. Actually, that's not true. We talk about those days all the time, or at least I do. But anyway, the point is, 1.0 release, five years ago, very exciting. And in the time since, um, we've seen a lot of people using Rust. More and more people, it seems like, using Rust for more and more things. Kind of more things than I ever imagined. I guess, okay, that's not true either. I can imagine quite a bit of usage. Uh, but more than I dared hope for, for sure. And it's been really exciting. And we figured that now with Rust kind of growing in use, this was a good time to step back reflect on the last five years and the values that, that took Rust from where it is, uh, where it was, that is, to where it is now, and hopefully that will see us into the future as well. And it turns out that when we were coming up with the current Rust slogan, we actually put quite a lot of thought into it, into what was a slogan that really captured what Rust was about. And this is the slogan we wound up with, and I've highlighted two words, empowering everyone, because I think those are the two crucial words that have been the through line for Rust from its first inception to its current incarnation. Let me explain. Um, but I think we've, we've come to understand those words even better over time. Right? Initially, we did think about empowering because we thought about empowering C++ programmers. We knew that we had existing systems programming experts, like the ones who were working in Mozilla, that were maintaining million line code bases, and they were struggling. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of bugs to track down. A lot of subtle bugs with this with segmentation faults and irreproducible problems. And we knew that if we wanted to take those code bases to the next level, like if we wanted to extend Firefox with full parallel programming features and so on, doing it in C was probably beyond our resources. It was just more than we could muster. Uh, but if we could find a new language that would solve automatically a lot of those problems and let us focus on the things we actually wanted to do, then we could do it. And that's what Rust was all about. Right? And of course, you do see a lot of usage of Rust in Firefox today, and ever more every year, and that's super exciting. But along the way, this initial goal of empowering C++ programmers turned out to have a side effect that we didn't anticipate. And I first kind of learned about it watching this talk from Yehuda Katz, uh, Yehuda Katz uh, in 2014, talking to Ruby programmers. And what Yehuda was saying here was, hey, Rust is a new language. A lot of you have problems that were well suited kind of to systems programming. Like you need to make this bit of code more efficient. And before, it may not have made sense to use a C or C++ extension because the, the maintenance hassle wasn't worth it. But Rust changes the calculus and opens the door. It makes it a lot more accessible. And so that began this really cool blend that I think we've seen to this day of programmers from a bunch of different backgrounds coming together to work in the same language and in the same community and bringing these different experiences. And I think that has been really great for Rust. And one of the key things that you can see, even in this first example, is that while we often think of programming communities as different, we think of like C++ programmers and Ruby programmers, that's already a bit silly, right? Because many of us love to use more than one language. Uh, it's not, we're not like distinct things. But also that the problems and the experiences from one community can really help the other. They're not separated at all. Um, and we saw that with Rust, right? The goal here, we were targeting the problems of systems programmers, but it turned out we were opening doors and solving problems for other communities too. Um, 
This is some slides from Julia Evans' 2016 keynote, which I love. And, you know, we were, by making improbable programs possible, as she says, now we were empowering lots of people from lots of different communities. And that first time, I think it kind of happened by accident, right? But after that, we started to do this, take this approach more deliberately of, of looking for problems that affect one group and trying to solve them in a way that benefits the whole community. Let me give you a few examples. First one is going to be Cargo and Crates.io. So I have a confession. When I first started working on Rust around 2011 or so, people were talking about you know, adding a build system to wrap the Rust compiler. And I kind of thought, eh, I don't know if we should try to do this. It seems too hard. We're probably just going to end up recreating make files, but worse. It seems like not a good use of our time. Now, why did I think that? Well, you know, I thought make files were good enough, but I hadn't used systems like RubyGems, and I hadn't used NPM. Uh, I didn't really know what software reuse could really feel like. Luckily, there were a lot of people who had and who did, and luckily we did build Cargo, and we also built Crates.io, right? This repository that now lets you upload your packages and download and, and, and reuse, and now I totally get it. Uh, it's obviously, it's a really powerful tool to be able to just add one line of code and, and use somebody's package. And a key part of Rust's kind of empowerment story, a key part of making Rust programming productive. By the way, I'd like to give a shout out to the Crates.io team that tirelessly manages this website. Um, and Sean, one of the team leads, will be talking later today, although not, I hear, about Crates.io. I'm sure it'll be really cool. It's closing keynote. Check it out. Anyway, um, so, yeah. And in fact, I'm really, you know, it's great that we did, because if you look at messages about what people love about Rust or about their first experience with Rust or something like that, what you're going to notice is time after time again, Cargo comes up every time. Um, maybe not every time, most times. It's really cool. And, I mean, look, there's some quotes I scraped off of Reddit and so forth, but this person, they hate everything about Rust. They hate the module system. They hate how verbose it is. They think it's ugly. They wish it were JavaScript, they wish it was C++, I don't know. But they love Cargo, right? I think that kind of tells you everything you need to know. Another page I thought was interesting was this one. This talks about if you're coming to Rust from different backgrounds, what to expect. And it says when you're coming from C++, it may take you some time to get used to the type system, to get used to lifetimes. But in the meantime, you can enjoy using Cargo, right? And you'll get hooked on that, and then you'll figure out the rest. And I think that kind of tells you what you need to know that a lot of times you might be thinking like there's existing systems programmers, they're the experienced folks, they should be the ones leading the way. That's not always true. Sometimes there's people from other communities who have solved this problem. And it's often those experienced people who were kind of trying to tell you that's not a problem we're solving that benefit the most from the solution. Uh, and I can say personally that I have benefited, right? <laughs> Hacking on Rust, we used to have this make file to build Rust. It was an interesting make file. I learned a lot about make from this make file. I like how it starts with reading adventure. Uh, you know, it had lines like this one. Let me just blow that up for you a little closer in case you can't read it. There's six distinct dollar signs there, each of one. Each one is like one level of escaping or something. Luckily, I've forgotten all of how this worked. Uh, we have replaced this since with cargo. It's a much better experience. Um, and, you know, crates and cargo and crates.io are great tools. They're one tool of a large family of tools, and I think that's a key part of the Rust experience, too, that we've really tried to keep our tooling and our uh, accessible and fill the needs that people have um, to be productive and enjoy using Rust. But let's look at another example, error messages. Uh, so, Rust error messages around the 1.0 time period, they were functional, right? They told you, they usually told you the line of code that caused your problem. And they tried to tell you why, but they didn't necessarily do a very good job. And I think most of us, since you've got experience with Rust, you learn not to read the error message and just to jump to the line of code and like look around and figure out what was going on. Now that all changed around 2016 when we started doing this big push on new error messages led by Jonathan Turner. And the idea here was that we want to well, this was part of, I should say, a bigger push to improve new users' experience with Rust. Right? And one of the key things that new users like to do when they want to learn Rust is run the compiler on some code, and they're going to get errors. And so if we can make those errors better and help them understand the problem, 
they're more likely to stick with Rust. That was the idea. And that's what led us to these awesome error messages we have today. Uh, it's also kind of what, you know, we were taking some inspiration from Elm and from some other packages and Elm, so I don't know about Elm. Uh, different, diff there's now like some of this friendly competition where people are really fighting to have the best error messages and copying ideas from one another, and I think that's awesome, right? I love that. Uh, and I'm glad that Rust is, is, is in that, is part of that movement. And in these error messages, we've really focused on bringing your code to the front and actually explaining the problem, giving you suggestions on how to fix it. Uh, and it was not, I should say, just one person's work. It was a lot of people who participated in this. It was a real community effort. Right? We had to go through every one of the old error messages, and there are hundreds and hundreds, and convert them to the new format. And as part of that, uh, we brought in a bunch of new people, including Esteban, who has since kind of taken up the lead of the diagnostics effort in the compiler. And I love this tweet where he talks about his goal of can we make it so that you don't even need the Rust book. You just get all the information you need right from the error message. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get there, but I think we're getting closer and closer, right? It's really cool. Esteban also is talking uh, later in RustConf. Check that out. Now, all of this stuff was focused on helping new users learn Rust, improving the experience when people first start with Rust, but is it only new users that benefit from good error messages? No. Everybody benefits, right? Even people who've been using Rust a long time. Uh, and in fact, we're all just kind of accustomed now to actually getting useful information out of our errors. So it's been something that really worked for the whole community, even if it came out of focusing on the needs of new users. Now, one last example is the code of conduct. I think most of you know, it should come as no surprise, that the internet can be a hostile place. There are a bunch of jerks. They like to say things. They're not often that constructive. Um, and that kind of gave rise to a movement amongst software packages and open source communities and just communities in general to establish codes of conduct, right? And Rust is one of those uh, projects. We've had a code of conduct from the very beginning. Our code of conduct says, you shall not use harassing language, demeaning language, uh, and so forth, but it also says things like you should appreciate that there are design trade-offs, that not every design has a single best answer, and you can have disagreement about which one is the best. Um, and, you know, the goal of a code of conduct, part of it is to make the language a more inclusive space, to help get more people in, and you might think then that that's really what the audience is for, people who aren't currently part of the community trying to make their experience more pleasant when they first join. That's true. But interestingly, if you look at what motivated Graydon, he was the uh, founder of Rust, uh, initial person who started the project and who insisted on the code of conduct at that time, why did he do it? It's not that it wasn't for other people, but it was also for himself, right? Because he had been a part of many different open source projects in the past and language projects. And he found that you know, if he was going to work in this space, he wanted to work with people who were respecting these uh, precepts. Um, and so I think it's a good case of focusing on the needs of sort of newcomers to the community who might be turned off by the kind of style of discourse that had been happening actually makes the life for everyone who's participating much, much better. So um, I do say when we talk about code of conduct, Another key part of having a code of conduct is having an enforcement mechanism, which implies moderation. And we all owe a big thank you to the moderation team that does a very difficult job. If you'd like to appreciate how difficult it is, I can't recommend enough this comment by Burnt Sushi. The URL's there, it's on Reddit. I pulled out one particularly interesting quote, but it's a much longer comment and all of it's worth reading about how hard it can be to have to try to sit, stand in a conversation and, and draw the line of what is acceptable and what is not. Um, so thank you to them. Now, I've given three examples, but there's so many more, right? Once you start looking for empowerment as this theme, and especially this idea of kind of newcomers or learning from newcomers to benefit the whole community and learning from different communities to benefit one another and so forth, you start to see it everywhere. It goes from the language design, we have things like the ergonomics initiative, to the way that we run our project, right? Um, the, focusing on efforts like the Rusty Dev Guide or having RFCs and teams, to the tools that we use to run the project, like GitHub and so forth. Um, they're all oriented at 
empowering people to participate, empowering people to use Rust and to learn. Um, so I think it's really this, this central story of Rust itself. But I'd like to hand it over now to Mark, uh, who's going to give us an, another look at the history of Rust, this time from a more numerical perspective. A key element in making Rust the language it is is the people who participate in our community. The Rust team also tries to automate what we can to keep our human population happy. While we currently have 305 team members, there are many more people discussing and contributing to Rust on GitHub and our forums. We are also seeing hundreds of people joining conversations for the first time just this year. Not only are people joining conversations on GitHub and the users forum, but we are also seeing much more issue traffic. Over 2,000 issues are being filed each month. We can also see that ever since 1.0, we have been steadily accumulating issues across the organization. More issues are being opened than closed. This is one of the reasons the language compiler and library teams are looking at restructuring their interfaces to the wider community. We don't yet know if the ideas we've identified will work out, but experiments are ongoing. GitHub contributions are great, but aren't the only way to participate in the community. We've had more people publish crates in 2020 than commit to our GitHub organization. Crates.io is not only seeing thousands of publishers, but we are also seeing many new versions being published. And of those versions, over time, we're increasingly moving towards stability. Around 20% of the versions published in the last six months or 1.0 or greater. Having taken a look at all of these statistics, it is clear that Rust is growing rapidly. And growth means change. And although things can feel permanent when you join a project, the people that you're working with, the uh, structure that you're working within will last forever, that's not the case. People will leave, join new projects, new people will join, and this is okay. In fact, evolution can be a good thing. Um, so uh, it means the project is adapting to growth and changes. And as an example of this, the uh, teams within Rust didn't exist when the project first started. It was as a response to uh, the growth and the emerging responsibilities. And RFCs are uh, another example of an evolution in Rust. But change can be disruptive. And you may have encountered cynical takes on this, such as talking about the good old days or referencing something called the Eternal September, which is an event where uh, a large influx of new users into a community overwhelmed that community's ability to uh, induct those users and introduce them to the culture and norms. And this is uh, important for us because it's a consensus-based project. There's no benevolent dictator for life, as you may have seen in other projects. Um, we have to we have to deal with this by coming to an agreement around what the route around uh, routes forward. And the way that we can overcome disruption here is with a set of shared values and alignment around the things that we believe are important for the project. You know that values aren't optional. Not having a set of values is in itself a value choice. And in order to choose a set of values, we need to uh, consider what, uh, what's core to the culture of Rust. What do we want to preserve about it? And the answer is people. The Rust project focuses its values on people. And I'm gonna go through um, uh, three different kind of concrete manifestations of this, where you can see this uh, uh, hopefully uh, more clearly. So the first is in eliminating things that don't need to be hard. So one of the core promises around Rust, uh, which Nico touched on earlier, was around making it uh, feasible to write applications of a particular kind. And part of this is about reliability, uh, one of the key promises of Rust. That it just eliminates certain classes of bugs at compile time. You don't have to think about them. Um, it doesn't need to be 
hard thing to do. Another uh, example of this is the module system. And this is something that uh, the Rust project uh, iterated on. So the language team, as part of a project to identify the things that people found difficult to understand uh, or work with, uh, observed that the module system that was released in Rust 1.0 was uh, confusing. And so uh, actually created a set of RFCs to discuss and design a solution for this, which was eventually landed and is now the uh, is now available in Rust 2018. So if you download Rust today, you're actually benefiting from this uh, from this redesign uh, and this desire to eliminate uh, eliminate confusing or difficult things. The next example is educating on things that are hard. So we recognise that we're not going to be able to get rid of everything that's difficult, uh, but we can try and help people when they encounter them. So one example is uh, errors, which was covered earlier on uh, by Nico, which has had a lot of effort put into it. And this user has, uh, in years of using Rust, encountered an unhelpful error message for the first time. And as it happens, uh, this was improved shortly afterwards, and it kind of demonstrates the um, it demonstrates the success of errors that this is the first one uh, in those years. The other example uh, of this education is around the focus that Rust puts on docs. So Rust has a um, uh, a standard for creating documentation, Rust doc, that is distributed with the compiler. It has high quality documentation for the standard library, and it has automatically built documentation for every version of every crate that gets uploaded to the uh, package registry. And this is an incredibly uh, impactful thing when you're trying to start on a project, uh, trying to figure out how to use it. You know that uh, there will be some documentation available for you to use. The final example is providing access to spaces and power within the project. So the most, uh, the most obvious example of this is in the RFCs process, which is the way in which decisions are made in the Rust project to uh, post uh, a proposal in a public forum uh, let anyone comment on it, discuss it, and then have the uh, team come to a, uh, one of the Rust teams come to a decision on it. And it's a very uh, open process where anyone can have their say. Another example of this is the code of conduct, which Nico covered earlier as being a way to uh, provide spaces within the project for people to participate. Uh, finally, the team structure. So the creation of teams uh, is something that gives people power within the project to have their say to contribute. And this is something that is, uh, we've been talking about for a while. So this is a slide from the 2018 RustConf core team keynote and talks about making a space for people to uh, step into to help out in the project. And ultimately, the reason we center the, our values around people is because technology is by people for people. And so focusing uh, your values on people and caring about people actually makes great technology. Thanks, Aiden. Um, so we've just heard that you know, great technology is built both for and by people. And that, that is a, a critical value involved in building great technology. But I do think that the term great technology can be somewhat kind of ambiguous or at least vague, maybe to the point of meaninglessness. And so I'd really like to bring definition to that term by centering it around this concept of impact. 
Uh, and so I think one can say that great technology is technology that has impact. And I think that begs the question then of what does it mean for a programming language to have impact? Uh, and this can feel like a very philosophical question, which may be coming from me is unsurprising to many, but I actually think this is a question that Rust has been asking itself since very, very early on. And I think it has, you know, centered a lot of the conversations and questions and decisions that the project has made over time. And hopefully you've seen a fair amount of that from what my other presenters have talked to you about today. Um, but I think one of the moments where we became most explicit about the type of impact we as a programming language, Rust, wanted to have was during the release of the 2018 edition, which certainly had its uh, bumps. It was a really, I think, emotional, but like critical time for the project. But one of the biggest portions of it was, at least to me, um, releasing a new website for the project and also a new slogan. Um, and so the slogan that after some hard conversations with the community that we uh, eventually came up with was this, um, a programming language empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software. Uh, and so this was not something that I had originally chosen, um, though I had originally included the language of uh, empowering everyone. And that's the part that I really think is by far the most interesting, um, but also the most critical as we think about the type of impact that Rust wants to have. So what do we mean when we say empowering and empowering everyone? So Rust wants to be empowering. Uh, I think this is really central to a lot of the reasons why people like working on Rust. I also think that the concept of empowerment is central to a lot of Rust's ability to be incredibly successful. Uh, but I think the, the term empowering hides within it a lot of interesting and like really poignant complexity. So, it's not a talk, right, if we don't like look something up in the dictionary, and we're going to do that for a while in this section. Um, but the term empower uh, here is a verb meaning to give someone the authority or power to do something. And I don't think that that should blow anyone's mind, but something that I think is really critical in here is that at the center of the word empowering is the word power. And power is a really, really interesting and really important concept. So here, what I've done is kind of an inverse lookup, but I've looked up the term politics, which now people might be going, Ashley, what are you doing? This is a talk about programming languages, and now you're bringing politics in it. Don't be that person. But what I want to say is, by bringing up our slogan that we seek to empower everyone, I've actually already, we've already brought politics into it because what is politics? So the first half of this definition says activities associated with governance of a country. And so that's probably what most people think of the term politics when they originally think of it. But I think this second portion is the part that is significantly more interesting. So here it says, especially the debate or conflict among individuals or parties having or hoping to achieve power. And if you recall, we have this key word empowering inside of our slogan. So the idea of politics, which I would just define as systems of power, right? Because Rust seeks to be empowering, we are already seeking to be political, right? Rust wants to be political. And this may be a controversial thing to say. I could imagine that there are people who are frustrated by this, but at the end of the day, I think it is by far one of the most core and foundational concepts in Rust to the point where it's not just that we want to be political, it's that we always have been political. Um, and that's something that we think is really important. Now, this also isn't terribly surprising, right? It's true that Rust is trying to be explicitly political, but all technology is political because technology fundamentally gives certain sets of people power and the ability to achieve all sorts of things, the way we've seen software completely changing our society and our world, right? So technology is political, 
whether it wants to be or not. Um, and I think it's great that Rust really wants to explicitly be political. Uh, Howard Zinn, and I think many other people have said something to this effect, have kind of said, you know, you can't stand still on a moving train, right? Technology is political. So we can, we can choose to say, oh, Rust, it's just a programming language. It can't be political. Or we can embrace that and, and try and do our best to be as deliberate and focused on our political aspects as we possibly can. So what I think, when I think about our slogan of Rust wanting to empower everyone, to empower people, is that our fundamental relation to power is that we're really interested in redistributing it, which is an incredibly you know, powerful idea, no pun intended, right? So what does this mean? So we've talked about how the Rust project focuses its values on people. And I don't think that many people would think that that is terribly controversial. But I think it starts getting really interesting when we acknowledge that while we want to help everyone and we want to empower everyone, at some point, when we think about things, we need to choose certain people. And so while in our previous conversations, we've referenced the idea that there's false dichotomies, that like a C++ developer and a Ruby developer still aren't really all that different. And I genuinely believe that to be true. I think that that can be true while at the same time acknowledging that as we seek to be a project with impact, uh, we cannot be everything to everyone. And so we have to make choices about the types of people we focus and center on in the project. So in the Rust 2018 keynote, I made this Captain Power, uh, Captain Planet, uh, Captain Planet slide, where I talked about all the different audiences that we see in the Rust community. You know, we have like the Rust, Rust diehards that have always been Rust, always forever. Uh, we've got folks from academia. We've got folks coming from lower level languages like C, C++, assembly. We've got some higher level scripting language people, JavaScript, Python, Ruby. We've got people who have never programmed before who come to Rust wanting to be programmers, so brand new folks. And this is part of the like really vibrant diversity that I think makes Rust really, really amazing. Um, but we cannot, all of these different audiences have very different needs. They are very, very different types of people. And we want to embrace all of them at the same time, but focusing on all of their needs equally at all times is not something that any project is capable of doing. And it makes it incredibly hard to focus. And so we've heard this slogan, right? Like a rising tide lifts all ships. Uh, and what's interesting about this, I looked up this Wikipedia page for this slogan, y'all should check it out because it's not nearly maybe what I think the Rust ideology has kind of adopted this slogan to mean. Um, but in here, there's like a hidden judgment, right? I think, and the judgment is, is something that I think we can all agree on, which is, so we say a rising tide lifts all ships. But the judgment here is that a rising tide should lift all ships. Uh, and that's something that we'd really want to be the case, but now this is a, an aspirational slogan, right? And then if we really think about it, we say a rising tide should lift all ships, but you know, it often does it. Um, and that's something that we don't think is acceptable, right? Like we think that a rising tide should lift all ships. So as I said before, Focusing on the needs of everyone all at once can be incredibly difficult. And I think for a project that's largely built of volunteers, uh, our focus and our attention is by far our greatest resource. And it's certainly the resource from which we can derive the absolute most value. Uh, and so the real question here is as we focus ourselves on people, as a project that values like the humanity of technology, like what should we focus on? Where should our focus be? And so what we've settled on is we really genuinely believe that we should center on people who have the most need. So these are people who, you know, have the least amount of resources, um, the least amount of ability to help themselves. Uh, we think that those are the folks who need the most help and as a result are the ones who deserve our focus. Um, and the awesome thing about this that we've heard from Nico is that when we focus and center on the people with the most need, the things that we're able to produce actually end up helping everybody 
sometimes in really surprising ways. But at the core of this, this is our political choice, that we want to center the folks with the most need. So as we look at this slogan, a language empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software, I don't want you to think that we've thrown this everyone out. However, I think that this is true, but there's a core of it that is truer, which is we are a language empowering everyone, but especially folks who didn't think that systems programming was for them. There was a big argument about whether or not we should include the term systems programming in our slogan. And we ended up taking it out largely because it's been such a gatekeeping term. It's kept people away because so many people self-identify as someone who could never be a systems programmer. And while it's not in our slogan because that sentiment around the gatekeeperness of the idea of systems programming is 100% true, at the core, we still want to take that concept of systems programming and break it free from that sense because we want it to become something that is accessible to everyone. And in that sense, we're trying to redistribute the power of systems programming. And that redistribution is our impact. And it is fundamentally political, whether or not you find that distasteful. Um, and it's something that I think the Rust project is incredibly excited about. And so we've done a lot of really interesting things. There's things where we've been able to see this today. So this is Rebecca. Rebecca is one of the speakers today here at RustConf. Um, and she had tweeted that it kind of owns that more than 50% of the RustConf speakers are trans this year. And I got to say, like, that is so friggin' cool. I have never been to a conference where that is true. And I am really proud that that conference that I get to experience that at is RustConf. And I, I also don't think it's a coincidence. I do not think it's by mistake. Uh, and it's really, really exciting to me. But simply because we have wins like this, like doesn't mean that we can just like fly the mission accomplished flag, right? We have done some amazing things, but there's so much more that the Rust project wants to do. If we really want to achieve that ambition of redistributing the power of systems programming, um, we've, we've got a lot of work to do, right? And if there's anything you hear from me today, it's that Rust has some pretty amazing ambitions. And these ambitions are what motivate me to work on Rust. Uh, and that's fucking awesome. But, but our ambitions right now are currently greater than our capacity. We, we've got dreams of doing some pretty big things, but we want to do them right. And doing them right means that we need to cre create more capacity for ourselves to be able to achieve those goals. Um, I was talking with my friend Jen Schiffer recently, and we were talking about these concepts of accountability and aspiration. I think I've covered pretty seriously that we have some pretty huge aspirations here at the Rust Project. Uh, but what we really need now is accountability. And I think that we know what we wanna do and we now need to build the organization that's going to get us there. And to do that, we're gonna need all of your help. So it's time for us to grow. And everybody who's in this audience today, who's watching this at home, uh, we, we really need you to get involved. And so if these ambitions and these aspirations that I've shared about, uh, haven't scared you, have excited you, uh, describe a future that you want, uh, we, we need you to come help us get that done. And uh, here's Nick, who's going to tell you a little bit more about how to do that. So we've got to grow to achieve the things we want to achieve, but we've got to grow sustainably. You've probably all seen that Rust, for the fifth year running, was the most loved programming language, according to the Stack Overflow survey. I want to look back in another five years and see us getting that spot, you know, for the 10th year running. And I, I want to look back and see Rust getting better and better. I don't want to look back and think, well, that was a, a project with amazing potential and it's such a shame that it burnt itself out. So how are we going to achieve that? There's a well-known proverb in New Zealand Heaha te me nui o te o, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. And it means, uh, what is the most important thing in the world? The people, the people, the people. 
this holds, I think, for every project and every organization, very much including Rust. We, we have to look after our people in order to have a sustainable project. So how can we look after each other? Let's start by having a look at some of the concrete things we're going to be doing over the next year or so with uh, this goal in mind. The first thing I want to talk about is the 2021 edition, and uh, for some of you who were part of the 2018 edition, then this might seem like the absolute opposite of looking after each other. Uh, if you look at uh, RFC 2966 and the way that that lays out how we'd like to, to run the 2021 edition, the idea is that we're going to have editions on a regular cadence, uh, much like our six weekly releases that, that ride their trains, the edition are going to ride their own trains, it's just going to take three years to come. So that means that there should be no uh, high pressure deadlines uh, to, to get stuff finished for for the edition, and hopefully that will make it a much less stressful experience. We are intending to uh, continue to improve our governance and kind of organizational structures, and now's a good time we'd like to say thank you to the governance working group. They've been active for the last year roughly, and they've done some really great work uh, looking into the, the, the various governance structures that we have and uh, ways that we could make them better. We're also gonna, we're also actively exploring starting a Rust Foundation. The primary motivation for that is financial and that's an important part of looking after each other in the capitalist societies in which we live. We, we talked about RFCs earlier in this talk and RFCs are a really important way that um, we, we keep the, the evolution of Rust open, but they can also be uh, hard work. Uh, we're, we're looking at a whole bunch of ways that we can improve the, the RFC process. The compiler and language teams are experimenting with some of those changes already. Uh, we are trying to uh, make what the core team does more transparent. Now, some of the work that we do necessarily has to remain private, but a lot of it doesn't, and we have a, a large part of our weekly meetings are public. Uh, Pietro announced back in July that we're um, experimenting with a way to open up the, the public part of the core team agenda for, so that everyone can follow. I also want to go over some of the concrete ways we hope to continue to empower our users. On the language side of things, we're going to continue to focus on ergonomics and on usability, and I think the um, development of async await is a great example of that. Uh, async programming is difficult, but async await certainly makes that much easier, and as we go forward, hopefully we're going to have uh, to, to make it easier still and to, to have a more complete solution. Cargo Clippy is a great tool. It's really helpful for beginners to learn what idiomatic Rust looks like, and it can be useful even for experienced users to avoid some of the uh, possible foot guns. Cargo Clippy is um, getting a fix feature so that it can actually fix your code um, as well as just tell you what's wrong. IDE support is uh, really important in to, to Rust. Uh, it's something that is asked for or for, for better support every year in our surveys and I think again like as a, as a learning tool and as um, a tool for improving the effectiveness of programmers, ID support is a really empowering technology. Rust Analyzer is an alternate IDE backend that is uh, not based on the Rust compiler and it's because it's purpose-built it's uh, faster and more responsive than uh, the RLS. And RFC 2912 lays out the, the path for making Rust Analyzer the, the default for, um, for Rust IDE support. 
and uh, Rust Analyzer is available right now on Rustop, and the the VS Code plugin supports both uh, the RLS and uh, Rust Analyzer. We want to empower users to become contributors to the Rust project. And the Rust Forge and the Rust C Dev Guide are two great resources that um, have been really developed over the last year or so uh, for exactly that purpose. The Infra team have also done great work to make our um, uh, infrastructure easier to contribute to. It's hard to think of anything more important for building a sustainable community than safe, inclusive spaces. And I'd like to say thank you to the mod team at this point, because they're a big part of that and they do a really difficult job. So, thank you. As far as maintaining our inclusive spaces, I think that the Rust project started uh, really strong. We've had moderation, uh, code of conduct, uh, and then a, an official mod team from very early on. As the communities got bigger, um, maintaining these spaces has become harder. And um, a lot of the work that the core team has been doing, but we can't really talk about in public, has been dealing with a lot of these issues. And I think that um, the work we've done over the last year should uh, help us much more effectively to uh, maintain the inclusive spaces we have going forward. We believe that having a diverse community is really important. And to be honest, this is somewhere where we haven't done as well as we would have liked. Uh, there have been some uh, good bits, some highlights, uh, Rust Bridge, increasing Rust re Reach, just to name a couple. Uh, but overall, uh, this is not somewhere I think that, that we've excelled. We need to do better, and we will, uh, over the, the, the coming uh, year and into the future, we're going to make uh, building a diverse community one of the highest priorities for the Rust project. So that all reflects our strategy, but um, culture eats strategy for breakfast, apparently. Let's have a look at how we'd like the, the culture of the Rust community to look. First of all, uh, please look after yourselves. Uh, it's tough times around the world for in uh, lots of different ways and for different people. Um, don't let yourself get burnt out. That added stress is, makes burning out so much easier. Uh, if, if it's helpful for you to do less work, please do do less work. Uh, be kind to yourself. We, uh, we don't kind of need heroes to, to be a sustainable project, but we do need people who are going to be around for the long term. And please uh, look after each other. Uh, again, in when times are tough, uh, we just need to treat each other with a little bit more kindness than usual. A really important part of, uh, of that is uh, mentoring and community building. Uh, it's really essential work to, to do if we're going to have a, a sustainable project and a sustainable community. And I think Rust really does have one of the best uh, tech communities around, uh, but we can always do better. And as it grows, we've got to keep doing this work in order to, to keep it good and to keep it getting better. I just want to shout out to the Awesome Rust Mentors uh, website, which was put together by uh, Jane Lusby. Uh, this is a, a great website um, which simply connects mentors with, with mentees to, to help facilitate mentoring. We, we talk about empathy in the Rust project probably more than, than most uh, tech projects do, but I think it's really important. Um, empathy is how you understand the needs of another group, and uh, being empathic to our users is how we've uh, 
developed the language into being a, a good language, frankly. Uh, and being empathic towards each other is really important for having productive and enjoyable discussion rather than uh, horrible, stressful uh, arguments online. I think uh, to prioritize empathy is a, a, a great ask to, to finish on. That's all from us. Uh, I hope you recognize uh, the community you're, you're part of in this talk and hopefully it's something to, to think about about how we can keep it awesome uh, as we grow and as the language matures. Uh, we'd like to finish by saying some thank yous. Uh, we'd like to thank the RustConf organizers. Uh, Leia and Skylight have basically made everything work, including the um, transition to an online conference. Uh, Nell ha is the chair of the program committee and has also done a lot of the, the organizational work. And everyone on the program committee uh, they have done a, a great job putting together a, a, a really uh, good program that we hope everyone enjoys. And, uh, of course, our sponsors for coughing up the cold hard cash needed to make something like this happen. That's all. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.